So thank you all for uh, for coming today. <laughs> My name is Jenny Hickson, and um, I'm with the Maternal and Child Health Leadership Training Program here at Tulane. And Dr. DeSalvo graciously agreed to speak today on uh, public health leadership in post in New Orleans. Um, this series, seminar series is intended to bring people who've shown exceptional public health leadership in post Katrina New Orleans and after this year just in public health in general um, to speak to the Tulane community to highlight some of the great things that are going on in the city right now. And Dr. DeSalvo, who's the Chief of Internal Medicine at Tulane Hospital and in the uh, also faculty with the medical school, came back right after the storm and had some really great experience and did a lot of really uh, courageous things with going to army meetings and things like this. So <laughs> we, we really wanted to bring her experience and, and listen to what she had to say about leadership development. And on April 24th, uh, Vanjie Franklin is going to be coming to speak on her experiences after the storm um, and talk to us about, she works with the city health department. So she's going to tell us about getting um, health services back to the city and she was in the Superdome and all those kinds of things. She was actually in the storm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Thank you very much for being here today. Sure. Um, thank you guys for having me. I, um, yeah, they asked me to talk about something uh, around leadership um, in the post-Katrina environment, and, and the title of my talk is Leadership Under Duress, um, because I'm going to describe for you sort of um, some profiles of leadership that I witnessed after the storm, um, some people that I worked with um, who were under a great deal of duress, and um, I've sort of used each of them to exemplify qualities in leadership that I think made them successful in this environment um, and um, things to think about in terms of selecting leaders, um, God forbid, if this ever should happen again. Um, the, I, I kept thinking of this saying there in the weeks just after the storm, that Boy Scout saying that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I saw that so many times over and over again that, that people say, oh, you're so lucky that, so, that you found that tent for that clinic, you know. But it was really because that person was positioned in some way because of something they had done to prepare themselves um, it, before the storm. And that when that opportunity arose, that tent was available. And you'll, I'm sure, understand why tents are so important in August um, in, in, in Louisiana or September in Louisiana. Um, if you're practicing outdoors. And, and so I, I just think that recurring theme is something to um, keep in your head as we go through. I think a lot of these people also had the right personal attributes, some of which um, you can prepare for, some of which I think they just ha were born with. Um, and um, But nonetheless, hopefully we'll walk away with some ideas about kinds of leadership hygiene or things to think about um, to prepare yourself in case you're ever in a situation like this. Just to give you some context um, about about myself and what I was doing um, around the time of the, of the storm, um, and some of you know, since I know a lot of you in the room, that um, I was actually on vacation in Alaska when the storm came, and we were camping um, out in the bush, and we uh, found out about it on Sunday night when we were picked up by the bush pilot, and um, went into immediate denial, like everyone else. We're like, yeah, the thing will turn, it's no big deal, blah, blah, blah. And it was pretty difficult to get news at first up in Anchorage. Um, but uh, on Tuesday morning, when it was clear that the levees had broken, um, we took the next flight out and started making our way back down to um, Louisiana. We were just going to stay an extra week in Alaska because we had another week on our vacation. And we figured, well, if we're not power, we might as well just you know, stay and go camping. But then when it looked like the city was drowning, we started to work our way back and try to find our families. We were having, as, as was everyone, a great deal of trouble finding uh, our families and knowing where everybody was. Um, and it, so I, I sort of made my way down to Texas where the School of Medicine um, had set up shop and then made my way over to um, Louisiana really just to get my car and go back to, um, to Houston. Why? Because um, I identify myself in two ways, really. Um, one is um, as academic middle manager, if you will. And so I have responsibilities to my group, and it seemed like, well, the med school's there, so I should go there. And my principal mentor um, for my research was going to be there, um, Dr. Ha. And so I thought, well, I'll just go there. So it just seemed logical that I would have to endure Houston for a while. Um, but as I drove back to Louisiana on the 12th, I exchanged a series of conversations with some people I'll talk about today um, that made it really clear to me that there was a lot going on here and um, that some of the 
kids um, who are in town, um, we're, we're wanting someone with a little more experience and seniority to try to help them uh, manage a system that they had created and to figure out how to interact with some of these some of these entities that they were that they were coming across. They were getting in, they had done a fabulous job but they needed a little help. So I stayed after September twelfth and like most people above uh, everyone sort of above me, if you will, in the hierarchy was either in Houston um, or somewhere else because they had been called elsewhere. And so for a period of about four weeks I was kind of um, I was Tulane University on the ground in New Orleans. It was a really interesting experience for me. Um, I had the occasion to sort of send home to the mothership, if you will, reports every evening about what I was seeing and what was going on and who was talking to whom. And, and I was basically a journalist, you know, for the university trying to report back what I was seeing and getting instructions on what to do, if you will. And so I had the, because of that, I was uh, in a variety of settings. Um, in fact, um, for a little while, I even represented HCA, who owns the hospital. And there was one meeting when we were voting on whether the USS Comfort was going to come. And so I, we, um, I found out what the university's stand was, which they wanted the ship to come, and then the HCA didn't want the ship to come. And so at the meeting I was representing both, so I stood up and voted for the university, and then I sat down, and then I stood up again, and I voted for HCA, and the, and the other, we canceled each other's votes. But it just, I just tell you all that to, to give you some idea that I had this really unique experience that I don't think a person in middle management would normally get this early in their career. And I, it gave me this tremendous overview of the university and all the intricate pieces of it and the health system as well. Okay, um, so what we're going to talk about then are some, pro I'm going to use some profiles of people from the storm that I uh, worked with in that window, many of whom I knew before, but really didn't know them in the way that I know them now and respect them now. Some of those attributes of success and then um, some self and institutional preparedness suggestions, just a handful um, for the future. Um, so because some of y'all are in the School of Public Health and because of the way she just introduced me, Jennifer, I'm going to give you a little context about, about the School of Medicine that I find surprising that the city of New Orleans didn't know before the storm and that many people in the School of Public Health don't know. So for example, when uh, people think that the School of Medicine went to Houston and that everybody was there, and that's actually not the case. The medical students were in Houston, about 600 of them. Only about 20 faculty were there. The rest of the faculty were either here in New Orleans or in southern, the southern Louisiana um, or in other, other parts of the country that they had evacuated to. So it wasn't like we all just sort of picked up and left. And certainly in my group, um, after they evacuated the hospitals, they dispersed briefly, but um, the general internists, of which there are about 30, we had about 20 back here in New Orleans pretty fast um, that were working. Some of working in mobile units with the VA, which is one of our training partners. Um, some uh, working in HCA facilities that we opened up, which I'll talk about, which is our second partner. And our third partner is Charity Hospital. So those are our three training partners. Um, and that distinction is something, I have to be honest with you, though I've been in I've been in medicine, I've been on the faculty now for like a long time. And um, the, the, I don't know exactly that's why I said a long time, something like 10 years. And I never really thought too much about the difference between undergraduate medical education and graduate medical education. And I'm just embarrassed to say that to you guys, but it's really true. It's all so mixed on a daily basis. But undergraduate medical education, or their medical students are revenue generating. They bring money into the organization. So they're the first thing to get taken care of, just like public health students, right? The residents cost money. That's after they graduate medical school and they're in training. They cost money to the university. They shouldn't, but they did in the circumstance. And so they got a little marginalized at first. Faculty are particularly very expensive, and we got extremely marginalized. Um, and, and so that was an a interesting experience for me to watch um, how there was a class system that developed really fast. Um, in the absence of any revenue for the school. So this is downtown out in front of um, what used to be the internal medicine practice um, on the corner of LaSalle and Tulane Avenue doing some evacuation. Obviously I didn't take these pictures because I wasn't here, but um, one of my faculty did. This is um, the second partner we have, Charity Hospital. This is the front of Charity as boat launch during evacuation. and then. Um, the water, as you all know, started to recede, and this is the day that I got back to New Orleans, September, I think this is actually September 13th, outside of Charity Hospital, when they started pumping, the city was pumped dry, and then they started pumping the water out of the basement at Charity. Now, 
But that day, I think we were there with some LSU faculty, and we sort of were eyeballing the place and said, it looks pretty good in there. We should go in there and see patients. That's what we were trying to do, because there wasn't anywhere to really see patients. But indeed, um, as you all know by now, we've never gotten back in. In the absence of traditional places where we took care of patients like charity, university hospital, um, or the VA hospital, we sort of made things up as we went along. And in fact, a lot of that had already been made up before I showed up, and I'm going to talk with you about um, this, uh, some of the people that were working on that.